welcome. We're going to start the last part of this unit, which is the new, mostly it's vocabulary. We're going to talk about wave motion and their interactions. First thing we need to talk is, about is boundaries or barriers. And a boundary or barrier is any location that involves a change in medium. So we've heard of reflection, so bouncing back from the barrier without changing speed. Diffraction you've probably heard of, bending around a barrier without changing speed. And refraction, which is traveling through a barrier and the bends because of the change of speed. We're going to kind of use those in the next few slides. Reflection is the turning back of a wave as it encounters a boundary. So you've all experienced these. Lots of things reflect. Um, mirrors and metal and water, so there's all kinds of things. The screen of your iPod or your uh, smartphone or whatever that also reflects. So you know a lot of these applications. So mirrors um, have been placed on the moon, were left on the moon, and there are a few observatories that actually can send, have the coordinates, and can send a laser beam to the moon and have it hit that mirror and bounce back and they can measure the speed of light and since we know the speed of light we can also tell if the moon's getting closer or farther or um, if the distance has changed at all so that's kind of cool. Also the acoustics when you design a theater or now people have sound rooms in their homes sometimes and the acoustics, the way the sound waves are bouncing around and reflect off the walls and ceilings. Uh, even here at school we have the um, sound room that is basically the black box which has very little of that bouncing and absorbs most of it which gives it an interesting acoustic characteristic. Satellite dishes are going to be able to focus the waves that are bounced to it as they send things around the earth or around a country and then they can be focused to whatever they want them to go through. Refraction is the bending of waves as it travels through a, a boundary. And when you've seen this, if you've ever tried to dive for things in the pool and having a game, and you know that where they appear to be isn't necessarily where they are when you go into the water because light is being bent as it goes from air into the water. And so the speed, if the speed's altered, if it decreases, then it bends towards the normal line. We'll do a lot more this when we get to light. But it works with um, all kinds of things. And it increases, then you get it to bend away from the normal line. And even the depth of the water or the salinity of the water um, can be a factor of this. And one of the things that's kind of neat about this is like uh, mirages. It's a reflection and, and a refraction because of the different heat temperature, uh, the heat content of the air. Kind of cool. Okay, if you've ever been on a boat or a boogie board or a surfboard, and as you get close to the shadow, shallow part of uh, the water, if these are coming in, you know that it starts to pull you down, down the beach and that can be attributed to the difference in the speed. Diffraction is when you get bending because it's either going to pass through or around an opening or an obstacle. And this diagram shows you light, but it works with waves, sound waves, as well as with uh, water waves. So if the length is greater than the obstacle or the wavelength is smaller than the hole, then you get a very small shallow reef. Um, shadow region. If the wavelength and obstacle are about the same size, the same way the wavelength of the hole, then you get a nice circular pattern. And if the wavelength is smaller than the obstacle or the wavelength is bigger than the hole, then it doesn't go through at all. And here's one example with a water moving down a river. If you look down from the top, you can see that there's going to be a zone behind the rock that the waves don't seem to appear to go. And if you look at it from the side, you can see the same thing if you look at it from a transmitter view. It's kind of cool. And here's some pictures that kind of give you that idea. So the same size object and hold. Hold and you get a real nice bending and we're going to talk about those overlapping layers in just a minute. 
okay? If the object is larger than uh, the wavelength, it doesn't go through. So if I shine a laser beam onto a wall and it's going to be reflected or um, absorbed, depending on the color, but it won't, you wouldn't expect it to go through. And same thing if I, you know, shot it, the la same laser beam at a ball, it would just hit the ball and come back. Whereas if I could get a laser beam to go around something very, very tiny, like a pencil lead or something, perhaps I could get some of this needed clearance. So we actually have a lab for that later on in the year. Here are some examples of diffraction. The electron microscope was using this and so that you can use x-rays to see things that are smaller than visible light. And sound waves, you've also noticed this, they can bend around corners. You don't have to be in line of a sound in order to be hear a sound. And sometimes the uh, bouncing of the waves, the reflection of the waves, can make the sound seem to jump around. Or if you think about an echo or something like that. You've heard of interference, so we have two types of interference that have to do with the principle of su uh, superposition. We have constructive interference and destructive interference, and it's exactly as it sounds. If it's constructive, they add together, and they cause it to be louder. If it's destructive, then they can actually cancel each other out, or they can reduce the ability for it to um, be heard. So it kind of depends on the amount of destructive, how it is in sync, if you've ever tried to tune instruments or tune a piano or tune guitars, you'll notice that if you have things slightly out of sync with each other, you get that pulsing sound. So that's pulse, a louder sound is when it's actually constructively adding. And then when you have it where it goes in a um, quieter sound, that's going to be where the destructive interference is interacting. It's kind of neat to hear those pulses. And that's one of the things, if you've ever been in a large band, you know somebody's out of tune because you start to hear those sounds that don't quite fit in with the rest. If you get total destructive, then you it's completely canceled out, and we call that a node. And if you get total constructive, then we call it anti-node, which is going to be the loudest of, uh, the, uh, of the sounds. Okay, so we've talked about that a little bit. Standing waves, I showed you the wave machine, or I will be showing you the wave machine, and it's the result of two waves traveling together, and they will have the same amplitude, wavelength, and frequency. So if I get them a little bit out of sync, it won't give you this nice standing wave, but if I can align it just perfect, it gives you these nice, pretty standing waves. Um, involving, and the standing waves has the constructive interference. You have all done this as well with the standing wave. If you've blown into a Coke bottle or a Coke can or even straws in your drinks and you can get um, a sound out of it, you are actually discovering the standing wave for the open part of your straw or bottle or whatever it is that you're doing. And so most instruments actually um, depend on this. And the type of material it's made from is what gives it its, its tone, but the principle between all of them is pretty much the same. So let's try a problem. Here we have, and this is bringing back kind of everything we've done so far, the speed of a periodic wave disturbance. So we've got a frequency. We have a frequency of 2.5 hertz. And we have a wavelength of 0.6 meters, and they want the speed, velocity, so that is going to be wavelength times frequency, so 2.5 times 6 is 1.5 meters per second. The, this time we're going to calculate the wavelength what they're asking for. They gave us the frequency, 0.5 hertz, and they give us the speed, 4 meters per second. And I know the formula is velocity is equal to wavelength times frequency. So if I have 4 meters per second is equal to the wavelength, 
times 0.5 hertz, I can solve for my wavelength. And that's going to be 4 divided by 0.5, and that's going to give me 8 meters because my seconds will cancel out. This one is giving me um, more information, 16 pulses per second. That sounds like a good way to get my frequency. So my frequency, 16 pulses in 4 seconds, which is going to give me 4 hertz. And they want the period. Well, I know that the period is 1 over the frequency. So 1 over divided by 4 is going to be 0.25. Point two five seconds. And the last problem, we have a two point two and a half meters separating a trough and a crest. Well, we know that a wavelength has to go from crest to crest or a trough to trough, so I know that my wavelength is going to be twice that that they gave me. So my wavelength is going to be 5 meters just because I know the definition of what they're talking about and they've used the terms that I understand. Okay. The next thing, they've counted 33 crests passing a given point. So here's sound, what sounds like it's going to be frequency. So I've got 33 crests in 30 seconds and that's going to give me 1.1 which is going to be my hertz because it's frequency. And they want me to figure out my wavelength, which I did. And they want me to figure out my frequency, which I did. So the next thing is period. Period is 1 over frequency. So 1 divided by 1.1 is going to give me 0.91 seconds. And then the last thing they asked me to do is my velocity. Well, I know that velocity is going to be wavelength times my frequency. So I have my wavelength, 5 meters. I have my frequency, which is 1.1 hertz. And if I multiply that out, I get 5.5 meters per second. And so hopefully you follow along with that. If you need any more help, make sure you ask in class. And otherwise, I will be seeing you soon. Bye.